Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to this month's Dev Camp with the amazing Ted Patterson, Principal Program Manager with the Power BI Customer Advisory Team. My name is Kelly Kay, and I'm the Community Engagement Lead or Community Program Manager here for Power BI at Microsoft. Welcome, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you uh, spending the time with us today. Ted, how are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. I've been working for about two or three months putting this material together. You know, within Microsoft, we had a little bit of a gap with, uh, you know, telling people how to do it in part of it, but not the whole story. So, you know, hopefully now uh, we have some end to end coverage of this topic. So pretty excited to present it. And today's topic is going to be on building multi language reports. So what I want to look at here is, uh, first of all, we have a um, Power BI DevCamp has a portal, you know, so if you have uh, never been there before, uh, you know, it might be good just to check it out for sessions like we have today. We have a specific page and you can also find, you know, the links uh, on those particular pages. Uh, also, we're going to provide some links for you, you know, inside, you know, of the uh, chat window uh, in just a second, you know, but one of the things that you know, we wanted to point out is that everything I'm going to do here, you know, is available in the GitHub repository. You know, so some of the things that you'll find in there, uh, you know, first of all is we're going to be working on Power BI desktop PBX projects. You know, so we have a set of files uh, that kind of show multi language report development and kind of the different milestones we get along the way. So those are there. And then also, you know, what you're going to see is that there's a lot of technical detail that I'm going to go through. So, you know, rather than having you try to remember tons of facts, you know, and programming details as we go through an hour, uh, you know, there's also a guidance document that I've created to go along with this material, either in docx or PDF form, you know, it's right in the repository. And, you know, this is a very beefy, you know, white paper-esque uh, document, about 50 pages. And once again, you know, we're going to cover several different you know things as we go along today uh and everything in the presentation you know will follow the exact same outline you know as this guidance document you know so what we're going to be looking at you know is five different sections you know we're going to start with a uh overview of uh multi uh language report development and that will take us about 10 minutes and then we're going to go to the actual phases you know that you go through as you're developing multi-language reports you know so we have to prepare our data sets and reports you know so they support localization we'll talk about how to add metadata trans uh, translations to a data set definition there is a sample of an external tool i've created you know that programs against the tabular object model you know to add metadata translations we'll look at this and at the very end you know the last topic we're going to talk about you know going beyond just implementing metadata translations and you know also implementing content translations you know what's the difference between the two you'll have to stick around uh, and learn about it in a couple slides okay so now that we have that let's kind of start with our you know basic overview so i want to build multi-language reports in power bi you know so let's start with the good news and that is power bi absolutely provides internationalization features and localization features so you can build multi-language reports. You know, the idea is you build a single PBX file and you have a report that can render for some users in English, other users in Spanish, other users in French, and so on. You know, and what we've seen is that this has been a very hard uh, story, you know, that we haven't given as much as we should, but because it's possible, you can do it. But instead we see people who take their report that's in English and they do a save as and make a second copy for German and a second copy for uh, Spanish. And then they have to go through the data model and change the names of their tables and languages. And it gets to be, you know, really hard. So, you know, building a multi-language report, you know, one PBX file that supports all languages, you know, is really going to uh, offer a lot of value there, decreasing maintenance and just overhead. Now here's the rub, you know, as we start getting into multi-language report development, you know, what we're going to find is that it's tricky. You know, it's not intuitive. And the deployment, you know, is going to require Power BI Premium. You know, so there's just plumbing aspects of the infrastructure, you know, where you have to be in a Power BI Premium or a Power BI Embedded capacity, you know, for 
basically the alternate languages to load in. And then the last one, and just I want to point these out at the beginning because these could be showstoppers if you're following the guidance here, is that Power BI apps you know, do not support localization. The report does, but once you put it in the app, the app has a bunch of things, you know, that just, you know, do not work, you know, for multi-language development, you know, so you have to find a different way to deploy your report other than Power BI apps. Okay, now let's get into, you know, this comment I made, multi-language report development is tricky and not intuitive. And the issue is that some parts of Power BI are designed to support localization, the data set. Other parts are not the report designer. So what you're going to see is that adding localization support can't be done with Power BI Desktop. You're going to have to move to some more advanced tools or possibly write custom code. You know, we'll see examples of doing both of those. And you really kind of have to have someone that has, you know, more of a professional level of knowledge of technical issues. You know, so people who become experts at Power BI Desktop you know, might be overwhelmed, you know, by some of the technical aspects that we're going to look at here. Now, how does, you know, going to a multi-language report development process change the way that we work in Power BI Desktop? So report authors have to only use features that support localization. And so what you're going to see in this session is that there's tons of techniques that we use every day when building Power BI Desktop reports that can't be used anymore because they don't support localization. So if you have an experienced team or you yourself are experienced, you know, it, the challenge is really learning what not to do more than it is learning what to do as you're building reports. And if you have an existing report, you might find you have to undo a bunch of things that don't support localization, you know, before you can start moving forward again, you know, and start adding things like a navigation uh, you know, scheme, you know, into your report that does support localization. Now, at a high level, here's the issue. Let's say I have a PBX file and my PBX file defines a data set. And, you know, I'm going to start calling it a data set definition, you know, because it defines the schema. It also has a report layout. And what we find is the data set definition supports translations, but the report layout does not. You know, so if both of them supported localization, things would be straight ahead, you know, but anything that needs to be localized has to go in the data set. Now, you're going to have data set object types that support localization, and that is the table, column, measure, and hierarchy. And also, what is localization? It's basically just supplying, you know, text strings that the user sees in different languages. So what you'll find is that a database object like a table, you know, can have one localization for the caption, and caption, just think of it as the display name. You can also have a localization, you know, or a translation for the description or for the display folder. Now, what you're going to see is that you're going to be able to localize the names of tables, columns, measures, and hierarchies. But when you create reports, there's this common aspect of adding labels, just random text, you know, for something like a heading uh, or a button caption. And so the first thing you ask yourself is, how can I localize some text that's not stored in the, in the data set definition? You know, and the answer is you can't. So what you have to do is come up with ways to kind of get the report labels you know, into the data set definition where they can be localized. And we'll see a special approach for that you know, coming up in just a little bit. Now also, we're gonna first work with metadata translations. So they change you know, the names of your tables and you know the fields inside we can use them to change you know labels text but they can't be used to change row based content you know so you have product names and you know those cannot be localized so we might have to use a content localization strategy you know and once again i'm going to call out that going down this road today you have to load everything you know into a workspace that has a diamond you know whether it's power bi uh, premium or Power BI Embedded. It's just that the way that metadata translations load into a report today do not work in the shared capacity. Okay, now let's keep going through here. Now there is a live demo. You know, if I kind of jump over here to the browser for a second, uh, you know, the live demo just allows anyone on the planet, you know, to go to this one URL and, you know, basically, and I want to refresh it if it 
times out. Okay, so the idea is that you know you can see a report you know in language one, language two, language three, language four, and language five, and you know we have a navigation you know that goes down the side over here. You know, and as you look at the different pages, you know what we wanted to do is just kind of give you a sense of you know what does the multi language report look like when it, in action. You know, so here's a page you can go to you know and just see what the report looks like you know across five different languages. Now, we have to support metadata translations in any case. You know, but then the question is, do you also need to localize the content in your rows? You know, what I'm going to call content translation. Some people also call it data translations. You know, so you have things like product names and product categories and maybe country names. You know, so what you'll find is that in some cases, you know, you might need to implement content translations. In other cases, you might not. Now you can add support for content translations, you know, using various design patterns. We're going to look at that topic last. You know, what we'll do is we'll kind of see that for Power BI today, the best way to implement content translations, or at least the most straightforward, is to generate one row per language. Anyway, I'm going to defer, you know, getting into the details of this to the end. And once again, you always need to implement metadata translations. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't need to implement content translations. So we're going to kind of wait to the end to cover that topic, you know, since it's not a requirement for all projects. You know, but now let's kind of take a look at, you know, this finished report. You know, so what do we have there, you know, on this page? Top five products, it's a heading. You know, you have product rank, image, product sales revenue. You know, those are column names. You know, but then as we go down the rows, product names, cheese, oranges, potatoes, milk. Uh, how do you say cucumber? You know, so cucumber in German, you know, would be gherkin, you know. Cucumber for people that pretend to be from Spain would be pepinos, you know, and, you know, if you were in, uh, you know, Holland, you'd say uh, something like that. OK, um, better at programming languages than spoken languages. Anyway, I digress, you know, but what I want to kind of get across to close out this first section here, you know, is that there is this, you know, set of stages during the development process. You know, so step one is to start preparing your data sets and reports to support localization. You know, so you got to create your data model, you know, decide what tables, columns, measures you're going to show. Are you going to use hierarchies? Are you going to use, um, you know, display folders? Now, we're going to create a localized label table. So I have a way to localize my, you know, strings that I use for headings and button captions. We're going to see that technique coming up. You know, and also when designing reports, you have to avoid using techniques that don't support localization. You know, in the next section, that's what we'll focus on. Okay. Now, after that, we're going to start adding metadata translations. You know, so once you've got the report ready for localization, let's just start loading in metadata for languages. And so, you know, I'll add the meta tra metadata translations for Spanish, French, you know, any language that I want. Now, the final thing, and this one, you know, is not always required, is design and implement your content translation strategy. Okay, so now we're going to show and kind of look more into these individual uh, topics. Okay, now, as I come back here, we're at a section break. Um, so our first question here, I see one, uh, and that is, um, does that mean, oh, do we have several questions? OK, well, I see the last one that came in. Uh, does that mean we create multiple pages to translate the static strings, you know, like title text? You know, absolutely not. What you're going to see is that we'll create a measure and its name will be your text that you want to localize. And so you can use that across any page that you want. And if you use it on five different pages, you go and change it in one place. Yeah, so you don't have to, you know, to worry about that. Great question. Uh, will the recording of this presentation be available? Absolutely. You probably already answered that, uh, mm -hmm. Kelly. Yeah, uh, and, and it will be available on, um, we're going to post it to YouTube next week. And then we also have the video posted at community.powerbi.com if you go into the webinar and video gallery. And I put the link in the chat. Super. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to section two preparing data sets and reports for localization. 
Okay, the first thing that you should you know, figure out is how you plan to package your reports and data sets for distribution. So let's look at the three most common ways that our customers do that. You know, the keep it simple approach, you know, would be create a single PBIX file, and that contains your data set definition, you know, and your report. And it gets to be simple. One person can do everything. We publish the PBX file. We have a report and data set. And then if I make changes to either the report or data set, I can simply publish it over top of itself, you know, to basically do the upgrade. Yeah. But that might not be great. You know, the larger, um, you know, the, your environment and the number of people working is, you know, so what gets to be common is that a company wants, you know, one team to own the data set definitions and other teams to own the reports. You know, so we have one team that creates a PBX file that's a data set only. You know, and even though it still has a report, we kind of ignore it. You know, as a Thursday fun fact, if you're using the Power BI API to import a PBX file, there is a parameter that you can say ignore the report and just basically push the data set, you know, into the target here. So once again, you know, this is another option that you could use. Now, the third option is for advanced data modeling folks that don't even want to use Power BI Desktop. You know, so you can use the advanced uh, tools such as the tabular editor and other tools, and you can create data set definitions that just get saved, you know, as a .bim or .bim file. Now, the good news here is whichever of these approaches you use, my guidance is going to be the exact same. There are things that you do to the data set, and there are things that you do when you're building reports in Power BI Desktop. You know, so you could use any of these three approaches and you basically follow the exact same guidance, you know, to be successful at building multi-language reports. Okay, now, a couple things about localization. And, you know, before we even, you know, get into things that are specific to Power BI, you know, everyone will tell you plan localization from the start. You know, if you've been working on a project for a year, with no regard for localization, it can be pretty painful to add it in after the fact. The other general comment, you know, is plan for growth. So as you're adding, you know, labels to a form with a text string uh, inside, what you might find is when you switch from English to another language that it grows, you know, 30% in width. You know, so just as you're adding visuals and labels, you know, give them some padding, you know, so there's some room for growth and always kind of test your reports with each language, you know, to make sure there's not, you know, uh, inadvertent line breaks or things getting cut off. Okay, the other thing, and here's where we're going to get to Power BI specific techniques, you know, is don't use techniques that do not support localization. And what we'll see is if you ever add a text box or a button, you know, to a Power BI report, you know, we've all done it and you start typing in text, that text goes into the report layout, it can't be localized. So therefore you really can't use text boxes or buttons as you're building multi uh, you know, language reports. Okay, another no-no is page tabs. Page tabs have display names that once again are stored in the report layout, so they cannot be localized. Okay, so let's go through and kind of talk about, you know, how we're going to, you know, deal uh, with this. So what we're going to end up uh, doing, you know, is creating different tiles. Let me kind of jump into one of these uh, examples uh, right here. And so as I jump in and what I want to do, you know, let's say that I go to a page and I'm going to add a particular uh, visual here. You know, and let's say, you know, for my visual, you know, I decide I want to look at sales revenue. Uh, I want to go down and then I want to look at, you know, maybe a uh, customer and I want to see the uh, customer country. Uh, and then let's go ahead and put at least one more thing inside here, you know, such as the uh, product uh, category. You know, we'll add that, you know, into the legend right here. And, you know, the thing I want to point out is look at this title up at the top you know, measure name by uh, column name and column name. So what's kind of really neat about this is that if I go to my visual and I go to its title property uh, and down here, that's not text that's kind of literal text, that's dynamically generated. 
you know, but as soon as I go in here and I, you know, add Ted's uh, title, you know, all of a sudden that won't change. You know, so the guidance here is to, I'm just gonna go back and say, you know, revert to default. And the idea is that this is not hard coded, you know, but it's dynamic. You know, so back here, you know, what's kind of nice is if you just don't touch the title, you know, look how, you know, it's going to be displayed as long as you've done the metadata uh, translations, you know, for those columns and measures. Okay, once again, you know, it works out well. Now, things that don't work out so well is adding text boxes or labels. So there is this strategy where you create a localized label table. And the idea is I need these strings that just go in random places around my report, and I need to localize those. You know, and once again, people start by asking the question, how can I localize something that's not stored in the data set definition? And the answer is you cannot. So the question you should be asking is, how do I get my labels and somehow integrate them into the data set definition uh, you know, so that they can support localization? And the way that we do that is we create this table and it's called localized labels. You know, lots of different ways that you could create this table. You know, I just generally use a data table function in DAX, you know, create new table and create that. The guidance doc kind of goes into the details, you know, but now you're just going to kind of start adding uh, measures, you know, and once again, you know, the idea is that once you have all these measures, let me go back here, you know, to, uh, you know, look at localized labels. You know, now we've got all these localized labels, and the strings are measure names, but the idea is since they're measure names, you know, they can be localized. Now, the next thing, you know, that we have to do is figure out, you know, how to get these labels and their localized names, you know, onto a particular report. You know, so the way that you create the measures is pretty straight ahead. You say, give me a new measure, you put in the text string, and then you say equals, and you have to give it a DAX expression, but we're just going to set it equal to zero. We have to have something zero doesn't have any significance, you know, but allows us to create a measure. Now, once you've created this localized labels table, you need to surface them. You know, so now we're going to look at two options. You know, option one, you know, is to use one of the built in core visuals. You know, so for instance, the stack bar chart. So I'm gonna add a stack bar chart, you know, inside here. Now that I've added the stack bar chart, you know, let's go to something like European sales and I'm gonna drop it into the values data role. And as you drop that, you can see the title up here. Okay, now let's do this. Let's go to the title. And, you know, as I go to the title, uh, you know, let's go ahead and, you know, make it bigger. You know, maybe I want it, uh, you know, much bigger. You know, let's go ahead and make it, you know, 48. Uh, and then, you know, what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of collapse around it. You know, so once again, you know, you've kind of seen this technique, how to use it. And, you know, what we have to, you know, say about this technique, you know, is that it's nice in that you don't need to do anything customized. You just use, you know, one of the out of the box, you know, what I'll call the core Power BI visuals, you know, but then you only have the title section. So you can change font size, you know, you can change whether it's centered or left, right, you know, but there's some things that are obviously missing, you know, having kind of a vertical center and having padding on the top and bottom, you know, you just kind of can't get that control. You know, so another thing I wanted to present as an option, you know, is creating a custom visual. Now there's a custom visual that comes with this code sample. You know, so if I come back here, you know, let's go ahead and take my custom visual here. And as we add the custom visual, you know, now we'll add European sales report, you know. And so what I wanted to kind of show here, you know, is that now with a custom visual, you know, you can do things, you know, such as, uh, you know, let's go ahead and set that to, you know, a large uh, font. Uh, let's go ahead and kind of change the different colors uh, inside there. OK, you'll probably never ask me to be uh, your interior designer, you know, but now let's go ahead and, you know, uh, you know, but the idea is that now, you know, a company that's willing to create a custom visual, you know, could basically just take over and extend this, 
you know, to kind of get any type of visual formatting that you like, you know, for your visuals. Yeah, and what you're going to see, you know, inside of our sample here, you know, is that these, you know, are used for all the different labels, you know, inside of the report. You know, basically we have, you know, the same thing with, you know, this custom visual is being used for that. Okay. Now, if you want to just test out the custom visual, you can basically take the PBI Viz file and just import it into a Power BI desktop project. If you open one of the PBX files, you know, that is part of the sample, it's already in there. Um, and then you can start playing around with it. You know, I'm not going to dive into the, uh, the developer details here, you know, but what you see here is that, you know, you're able to provide your own section. And for those of you who are interested in drilling down, you know, the source code for this custom visual project is just right there, you know, inside of the GitHub repository. You know, so if you've worked with custom visuals, you know, you can start this up. And, you know, one thing I have to say is that I've worked on custom visual projects that are so, you know, um, advanced and it takes your, you know, a long time to wrap your brain around it because of what they're doing with all the data. But this doesn't have any data. This is actually a the simplest possible type of custom visual because all you're doing is taking the name of an object and using three um, SVG objects, um, you know, with D3, you know, to basically uh, work with those. And the whole exercise is really about, you know, having properties that can be customized at the visual level. Okay. But once again, you know, that's there for those that want to use it. Now, let's talk about designing navigation. Hey, Ted. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry to sorry to interrupt. We do have a couple of questions about um, how to how do we translate the dates and currency based on the user locale set, um, like dynamic. In US, we will have the date as MMDDYYY, which is month month day day year year year, and in other countries, we have day day month month year year. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Let, let me kind of answer that by going back into Power BI uh, desktop for a second here. And, you know, let's go to something like, uh, you know, birth date. And now what I want to do is I want to go and take a look at, you know, one of those dates. Or I just look at this date right here, you know, but what we can do is we can go down here and we can change the formatting. And, you know, what you'll see is that some dates are generic, general date. Power BI Desktop sometimes encourages you to pick the exact formatting that you want. And what you're going to see there is that it will not change because you've told it what to do. You know, so you can use things like general date or, you know, what I've done a lot recently, you know, is to uh, under this, you can pick custom formatting. Uh, and then as you pick uh, custom formatting here, uh, what we can do is we can pick uh, short date. Uh, and, you know, now you've picked short date, you know, that will be month day if your culture is ENUS, but it will be 14-3 if your culture is ENGB for Great Britain. You know, so there's two things, you know, one is making sure you use general non-specific formatting and sometimes you have to get to this level, uh, you know, and the other thing is you have to make sure that the report is loaded with the right locale, which is simple to do in Power BI embedding and can be very tricky to do in the Power BI service. OK, let's see, is that the. Um, and the next question is, is there any performance concern about uh, using measures rather than static fields? Would using M parameters be an alternative? No, M parameters, um, you know, can't be uh, localized in the same way. Uh, so the fact that they're measures, um, is the lightest possible way uh, to do that. So, um, you know, once again, it's just, uh, it's the most straightforward way and it also performs well. I don't think you're gonna see any performance issues. Um, yeah, of course, if you have, you know, 600 localized labels, you know, you know, there are performance concerns as the number of measures gets really high, you know, so the localized labels would count towards the measure count, you know, so there is some issues um, you know, there. So let's keep okay. moving. 
Oh, okay, we had one more, which I actually think is a really great question. There, is there a way to localize the report tab names? Yeah, well, that's a statement. There is no way to there localize a, there the report no tab names, correct. And I'm yeah. saying you're absolutely correct. So that's exactly where we are right now. So thank you, Anonymous, for you know, pointing us to the slide. So the core issue is that page tab names are stored in the report layout. Therefore, they do not support localization. They will always be the same no matter what language loads. So what are we going to do? We're going to hide each one except for one. You can't hide every page. You have to kind of leave one as the landing page. You know, but now that we've done that, we're going to use another technique. So as again, you know, there could be other innovative ways, you know, to reach uh, this end right here, you know, but what you're going to see here is that, you know, we have something that looks like a uh, button. Uh, also, if I come back here, you know, and we go into uh, view and now we're going to go ahead and look at bookmarks. You know, the idea is that we'll start by creating a bookmark, you know, to navigate to, you know, any of the pages that we want to go to. And now, you know, we're going to make it such that, you know, these, you know, what looks just like a regular command button, you know, is going to allow the user to navigate to that page. So the way that this works is that you have a localized label down on the bottom. That's what the user sees. On top, you know, you have a shape. And the idea is that, you know, you have to go to the selection list here. You know, so if I now go to the selection list, yeah, and we kind of look at this right here. You know, what you can see is that we have two things. You know, we have the button, you know, which is the uh, shape. And as I come back here, you know, I should be able to kind of track this down and kind of see, you know, this button right here, you know, is what someone clicks on to basically, you know, execute applying the bookmark. And then down below, you know, we have the label. You know, so once again, you kind of have two things. The thing on the bottom is the thing they see. The thing on that top, you know, the shape is what responds to the user click event and actually does the navigation. You know, and I find that's kind of the cleanest way to get things. And then all your localized labels, you know, are going to be, you know, basically localizable just as measures. You know, so if you look at our sample, you know, here's what these buttons look like in English. You know, and as we move from you know English to Spanish, you know to French to German, you know now I have a truly you know localized navigation scheme, you know using this technique. Okay. So now that we've gotten to the end of that section, anything come in? How are we in questions, Kelly? Do we have anything to, to pick up here? Yes, we certainly do. Thank you. Sorry, I just had a minute to unmute there. How do we translate the calendar table where we have month names? And then the next one is, um, oh, and the next one's a comment. Okay, uh, how do we translate the calendar table uh, where we have month names? And that one is certainly tricky. Um, you can do, you know, what I've done here. Let's kind of go back here uh, and, you know, you might argue that this is, you know, taking the easy way out, you know, but one approach here when this thing finally shows uh, is that, you know, I have formatted my quarters, you know, as 2018-1, 2018-2, uh, you know, but if you want to actually localize month names, you know, that gets to be tricky and generally has to kind of be done with content translation which is the last topic we're going to cover. Um, <clears throat> okay, you know there are user requests to hide the last tab. Uh, please implement that. Well, you can't hide all the tabs, you know, but if you hide all the tabs but one, then you show it in the Power BI service. It doesn't show the tabs. It automatically hides them. So I'm not sure exactly, uh, you know, what scenario that you're getting for. If you want to kind of type in something, I can pick that up in a little bit. Okay, so let's keep going through here. Now we're gonna to get to the exciting parts. So what we now need to do is we need, you know, now that we've taken our report and we've kind of added, um, you know, the support for localization, now we just have all these database objects, you know, so they are tables, measures, columns, hierarchies, and the measures for localized labels, and we just have to add metadata translations for them. 
Now you can do that with this tool called tabular editor, or you can do it using custom code. I'm going to kind of quickly go through how to do it with tabular editor so I can spend a little bit more time talking about, you know, creating an external tool. Uh, also note that the techniques that we're going to use, I'm going to do it right on a PBX file that you have open in Power BI desktop. Because I think that's a common scenario, you know, as we are, you know, building reports that support multi-language, you know, but note that you could use the exact same technique, connect directly to a data, a data set that's loaded in the Power BI service. You know, so if you need to kind of patch translations, uh, you know, in a production system, you can do those as well. Now, there's this thing called tabular editor. So let's go back here. And you know, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to external tools, and I've already installed the tabular editor. And so if I open the tabular editor, you know, it is a tool that is going to you know start looking at the same data set that Power BI Desktop is. You know, so the idea is that Power BI Desktop starts up and it starts up a local session of analysis services and it loads the data set in. So here. You know, we're really just connected to the exact same data set that's been loaded in and I can see tables. I can see the customer you know, and what you're going to see here, you know, is that it's possible for you, you know, to kind of do something simple. You know, for instance, here's customer and here's translated names. And if I want to add my first one, you know, this is the only time I'll copy and paste something today, you know, but I could copy that, uh, you know, I could now paste that here. Uh, and you know, as we paste things here, a really important thing to remember is that Power BI Desktop, or I'm sorry, Tabular Editor and the external tool we'll look at next can save changes to the data set in memory, but they can't push those changes to the actual PDF file or the PBIX file. You know, so coming back to Power BI Desktop, you know, and choosing the save command here. You know, it's something that you have to kind of do as you're working with these uh, tools. Now, Power BI, or I'm sorry, Tabular Editor, get your thing straight, Ted. Tabular Editor allows you to work with the, the metadata translations by hand. They also have an advanced scripting feature. You know, so just to kind of show an example, you have to understand what cultures are. So there's two things, there's data set objects, and then there are cultures. And so every time you create a new PBX file with a data set, you, know, you have a cultures collection that has exactly one culture for the default culture. You know, so for our project, you know, the default culture is ENUS, EN for the language of English, US for the locale of the United States. Now, the idea is that once we start adding, you know, more cultures, we'll be able to add more translations. You know, so for instance, here we've just seen in a new project, we only have one culture, the default culture. What we you know, can do is we can start populating translations into the default culture. You know, note that uh, up here, you know, as you look at this uh, code uh, that I have right here, you know, we have something where inside of the advanced scripting, there are objects like model, and here is just an example of how you could write advanced scripting to kind of automate, you know, taking things like names and descriptions and moving them, you know, into the metadata translations for the default culture. Now, once again, you know, remember any changes you make in tabular editor, you got to go back to Power BI desktop and save your changes, you know, to make sure that those changes are persisted into the underlying PBX, you know, project file. Now, also note that the um, there's three types of metadata translations. You know, there are captions, you know, which kind of show up as translated names. And then there are descriptions and display folders. You know, so tabular editor, you know, both for working manually and when you're programming kind of has this, um, you know, this kind of simplistic, just write it to the translated names collection. It just works. You know, it's very nice, but you can kind of see that here you can either manually or, you know, through advanced scripting, you know, start populating, you know, all the different metadata translation properties that you need. Now, let's say I want to add a new culture, you know, so 
if I go back, you know, here, you can kind of see that there's only one culture, the default culture. If I go ahead and I say new translation, you know, I can basically pick one of these translations inside here. You know, so the idea is that you can add, you know, whatever cultures that you need. You know, so we want to support five languages, you know, beyond U.S. English, Spanish in Spain, French in France, German in uh, Deutschland, uh, and Dutch in Netherlands. Yeah, and notice that after you've added, you know, those new cultures to your project, when you go back to a database object and you look at translated names, you know, there'll be five different places, you know, that you can write those in. Okay, now what I've showed so far, you know, is that, you know, you can do things by hand in the tabular editor. You know, the tabular editor also allows you, you know, let's say you populate all the default translations. And, you know, after you've done that, you somehow take this JSON file that has the exported translations and you're able to kind of add the right JSON. And I'm leaving this pretty vague, you know, but if you were able to kind of update that exported JSON file with the new translations, you know, the whole idea is that you'd be able to kind of import it, you know, back in and you won't have to, you know, basically, you know, do things by hand. Now, what's a little bit awkward here is that when you export a, you know, when you say export translations, you know, they give you a JSON file format, you know, that might be very strange and unacceptable to a translation team. You know, so you might have to do some work, you know, to kind of put the translations, you know, into a better format. Now, let me check back with you, Kelly. Any questions here before we move on? And kind yes, of look at tool? yes, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, we have, can we build multi-language reports using the Power BI report server on-premise? Do these techniques work on the Power BI report server? Yeah, unfortunately, I have to say that none of, none of the things I'm covering here are applicable to Power BI report server, unfortunately. Um, so, okay. okay. And then um, we also have, uh, what is the best practice for accepting user corrections or suggestions to our translations? Well, I guess you're going to have to kind of come up with a workflow to do that. I'm going to kind of step through an example workflow that you can create, you know, but certainly, you know, you're going to have to get, you know, human beings involved, you know, inside of the process. Um, so I know that's a little bit of a fluffy answer, but I think we're going to kind of go through and kind of talk about, you know, how do we actually get the translated content, you know, back into the PBX file? So, and yeah. um, there is one person that wanted to um, put their user request also hide the last tab. Please implement that. Please go to ideas.powerbi.com and um, post a new idea. Uh, search for an idea if it already exists and please post it there um, if it does not. So thank you. Okay, well, let's keep going. here. So what we're going to look at here is I've looked at tabular editor, great tool. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of tabular editor, you know, but let's say that I wanted something a little bit, you know, more powerful, a little bit more control. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an external tool for Power BI Desktop. And the idea is that Power BI Desktop supports external tools that can kind of be bootstrapped from a Power BI Desktop session. And your tool can just use the tabular object model, you know, to connect to that data set. So what we're going to look at, you know, here, you know, is an example, you know, of let's move ahead. Which is called Translation Builder. Now, this is not a Microsoft product. You know, let me make sure I set expectations. You know, this is a developer sample I put out for other developers to take and run with, you know, so if it doesn't support something you want some extra feature you want to export to resx files you know the idea is that you need to extend it or find a developer you know to extend it but what i wanted to kind of just show is a proof of concept with this uh application you know so the idea is that you know if i'm working here in power bi desktop and i go ahead and i click on my external tool you know it's going to go ahead and start up and you know it's going to allow me to kind of see the translations and you can see, you know, in a brand new project right here, I have only one culture, you know, which is the default culture, and there are no translations for it. You know, so what I wanted to do is kind of step through using this application just to kind of show, you know, a common workflow that we'd be going through. Now, 
for those of you who want lots of details about this, you know, I'd say go look to the guidance document. First thing is that when you are building a tool, you know, you can just build it as a regular .NET application and EXE, and you're going to have to deploy it by taking a special deployment file that has the extension pbitool.json. And if you want to get this running, you're going to have to take the project and build it. You know, and one of the things you have to build it for is, you know, you have to make sure that the exe file is on your machine. Then you're going to update this deployment file and copy it to this folder. You know, common files x86, common files Microsoft Shared, Power BI Desktop external tools. Yeah, and once you do that, restart Power BI Desktop, and you should basically, you know, see the tile to launch your external tool on the tab there. So. What are we going to do with this tool? We're going to start programming with Tom. Now, I had an earlier Power BI desktop session, you know, where we introduced Tom, you know, so I don't really have time to go through fundamentals, you know, but a high level, you know, there is a server object that represents the, you know, analysis uh, services, you know, engine session. There's a databases collection and the database, you know, represents what we think of as a Power BI data set. And then, the database object has a model and the model is what provides you know access to these data set objects you know so the model has a tables collection and i can enumerate through the tables and i can start looking at columns measures and hierarchies and once again tables columns measures and hierarchies are the data set objects we care about because they're the ones that support meta metadata translations and they support it for properties which are caption description and display folder so we're going to have to learn to program those and then also there are going to be culture objects. So a model has a culture property, which is just a string, you know, E-N-U-S. So you can look at the culture property and get kind of the language tag for the default culture. There's also a cultures collection. And so we're going to have to start programming that. Now, if you want to dig into this sample, there is a translation manager class. You know, so if I go back here and we look at translation manager, you know, here's where all the code is. I'm not going to have time to step through a lot of the code uh, here, you know, but let's look at some of it. Now, before we even get to metadata translations, I want to point out one great thing about Tom, and that is you can create something called an annotation. What's an annotation? Think of an annotation as just something that you can store in a data set definition to create a custom property or a custom tag. Now, the reason that we're going to use it is that in Power BI Desktop, the data set gets a name, but it's a GUID. Humans don't like GUIDs. Humans like friendly names. So we're going to use an annotation, you know, to basically record that. Now, let's go back here. And so, you know, the idea is that, you know, here's the database name. We pulled it from Tom. If I now say, you know, set database name, and now, you know, let's give a more, you know, friendly name to this inside here. I go ahead and hit save. Yeah, and behind the scenes, you know, what we're doing is we're, you know, basically just kind of saving that, you know, as a custom property. And you can save annotations like I'm doing here at the model level. You can save annotations, you know, per table, per column, per measure. And there's all kinds of innovative techniques and, you know, testing that people do. And they just basically use annotations to keep their own custom properties you know, that are persisted, you know, into the actual, um, you know, definition of the data set. Yeah, here's just a quick example of the code and translations manager that, you know, you can set and get the data set name and forget, we'll basically look in the annotations of the model and see if friendly data set name is there. If it is, we'll return that. If not, we'll just return that lousy grid, you know, from model.database.name. You know, on the set side, it's a little bit tricky, you know, because you have to see, does the annotation exist? If it does exist, grab a reference to it and overwrite its value property. If it doesn't exist, you have to add a new annotation object to the annotations collection. And then once again, save changes, go back to Power BI Desktop and, you know, make sure you hit the save button. Okay, now, let's kind of dig into you know working with secondary cultures you know so one of the things that we want to be able to do you know is add secondary cultures 
And so what you've kind of seen, you know, inside of this is that, you know, here's the tool. And my project kind of pre-selected a, a set of different ones that I might want. You know, so let's say that, you know, we want uh, German, uh, you know, we want to go ahead and uh, add uh, Spanish, uh, you know, for fun, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, add Japanese, you know, we might as well add one of these uh, right to left languages, Hindi. You know, and you can kind of see that now that you have, you know, these new cultures, you have the ability to add translations, but there are none there right now. Okay, so the way that we're going to, you know, move forward now, you know, is that we need, you know, some way to add the metadata translations. Now, what you see is that the model has a set of tables, you know, that have columns and measures. So every time you add a culture, you can basically add translations into the scope of that culture for any of those data set objects. You know, so it's really just a matter of kind of finding the data set object, intersecting with the culture and adding translations. You know, so for instance, uh, you know, here's this code, you know, that is gonna populate the default culture. If I go back over here and we kind of click this, you know, what we're able to do is kind of quickly go down and kind of take the names, you know, of the table or the names of the customer or, and just add that, you know, as the translation. Uh, but now what we want to do is kind of get translations for these other languages as well. You know, but here, what you can see is, you know, when it comes time to add a translation, every culture has a object translations and a set translation. So here's your data set object, could be a table, you know, or a column or measure. Second thing is which property, caption, description, or display folder, and then what is the value that you're writing inside there? Okay, now let's keep going. And we've kind of seen that we can populate the default culture. Okay, let's get a little bit more exciting. Now there is something which is the Azure Translator service. So if I can automate adding translations to the default culture, and I have a web service I can call out to saying, you know, here's an expression in English, translate it into any language that I want, you know, that can give us some pretty nice options here. Now, in order to, to use this part, you have to create your own instance of the Azure Translator service. And what you have to configure, you know, in the translation builder external tool, you know, is adding a key, and that's kind of used as a password, you know, an application level password, and you have to add the location. You know, so the idea is that this functionality won't be there until you create your Azure Translator service instance and add those two things. You know, once you've done that, um, let's go back here and just kind of see what things are going to look like. You know, so what I'd like to do now, you know, is I'd like to, uh, you know, generate translations uh, for German. Uh, I now, you know, after that, I'm going to generate translations, you know, for some of these other languages as well. Okay, now once we've got that, you know, let's kind of go through and we'll do the same thing, you know, for uh, Spain. And, you know, now that we've done it for Spain. Now, as I go through here, you know, I'm not trying to suggest that machine translations, you know, will be high quality, you know, as human translations will be, you know, but there are some cases where they're very helpful. So let's say that we know, you know, what needs to be translated and we, you know, we know what language we need to translate it to. When you send those out, you know, it might take a couple of weeks, it might take a month to come back. But if you have machine gen translations, you know, you can begin to kind of do the work, you know, to test and make sure that things, you know, look properly in these other languages. Okay, you know, so now that we've kind of created these, you know, let's kind of uh, go back, you know, here, you know, into Power BI Desktop. You know, let's go ahead and, you know, save our changes. You know, and now that we've saved our changes here, uh, let's go ahead and publish this. You know, so let's say that we've kind of gone through this point of, you know, actually, um, you know, putting the metadata translations in place. You know, so back on the slide, I think I'm gonna quickly move through this. We're running out of time. So here's the code that calls to the translation service. And then kind of here's also the code that populates you know, a culture with machine translations. I'm gonna leave that code here. We don't have enough time to cover it, you know, but the uh, idea 
you know, is once we've done that, you know, we should be able to now kind of go back uh, and, you know, take a look at this report in the Power BI service, you know, and we should be able to start kind of loading in, um, you know, different um, <coughs> reports. And so what I want to show here, you know, is that if you're not using Power BI embedding, you know, but you're just kind of loading the report in the Power BI service, you know, we can use the language tab, you know, to load reports, you know, definitely handy during testing, you know, so some cases it might be, you know, what we want, you know, during uh, deployment. If we now kind of uh, move over to this right here, you know, what we should be able to see, uh, you know, with this report, you know, let's go ahead and test it out, you know, but now if we add a question mark and language equals, uh, and let's say ES hyphen ES, and now let's go ahead and hit enter. Uh, and what you, you know, should see now is that as it loads in, you know, is it loading in these labels? And it's taking a second to load in, but any second now, it finally loads in and I kind of see those inside there. If I kind of think of, you know, what are the, you know, different languages? Well, there's J Japanese, you know, so if I come back here, uh, and I have to remember J A J P. So J A and uh, J P. And you know now we kind of see you know what it looks like you know as things get translated into Japanese. You know notice that my metadata you know is being translated you know right along with the other one. And you know here is the um, <clears throat> last thing you know that I uh, want to do is. Let's go ahead and uh, go to a right to left. So Hindi, H-I-I-N. Uh, okay, so now we'll go here to H-I hyphen I-N. Yeah, and what we're going to see, you know, is it's going to, you know, begin loading. Um, and, you know, once again, you can kind of see that as things load in, I can start testing things in other languages. You know, so while I would agree, yes, usually we want to have human translations, you know, but it can be very helpful to have machine translations, you know, one, uh, because then we have something to do testing, two, because for our translators, it's easier to give them a starting point, you know, so they're either correcting uh, or confirming as opposed to creating everything from scratch. And then also I see that more and more customers are coming to us saying that we have to have multi-language reports because if we don't, you know, we face, you know, legal action, we face uh, fines for, you know, violating regulations and generally meta metadata translations is all you need, you know, to kind of meet those requirements. You know, but, you know, for cases where we do need, I think if I can have one more minute, Kelly, I'm going to finish up there. Okay. <laughs> I know we're kind of going a little bit over here, you know, but the last thing I wanted to kind of see with this is that we've also kind of given this capability here, you know, such that, you know, when it's time to create a uh, translation sheet right here, you know, we're going to be able to export something. And for this dev sample, you know, we're just kind of exporting this thing, you know, as a simple CSV format, you know, and the idea is that after someone, you know, has you know edited that file you know that we should be able to come back here and go back to our inbox you know and find that and so you know there's just a proof of concept you know of how to make an ex export import um you know framework there okay now we are kind of at time we should uh, let you finish this section let's let's go ahead and finish this section we have two questions um we won't be taking any more questions but how about you finish this section Okay, well, the last thing I wanted to show is that I showed you how to load, you know, with the language tag. The one thing I want to call out there is when you load with the language tag, there is a function in DAX called user culture that does not work correctly. You know, so if your default culture uh, is ENUS and you load it with French, the user culture will still be ENUS. So Microsoft has some work to do to make sure that we can kind of have a more reliable way to load a report with the right culture in the SaaS service. If you're using Power BI embedding and you're kind of using Power BI as a SaaS service or a PaaS service, then you have complete control. You know, here you can see that I can load the language, I can add the format locale, 
uh, you know, and load those in. Okay, now one of the things that we're not gonna have time to cover, and I'm just gonna point you to the, the guidance document, you know, is implementing a content translation strategy. You know, and that's just some work that you do on top, you know, with various designs, you know, but at this point, Kelly, why don't we kind of uh, see if we answer all the questions? Yeah. Not, mm -hmm. I know four, four more were posted since I said that, by the way. Uh, let's see, uh, what's the best practice for accepting user corrections or suggestions to our translations? And what is a good toolbox to start with with multi-language support reports? Um, there really isn't a good toolbox. I mean, I, I'd say that, you know, this guidance document and this developer sample, you know, are the only thing I know anyone in Microsoft, you know, has really put out there. Um, you know, there's this issue where we have data sets that support translations. So the team that, you know, basically managed the data set end certainly has documentation on how to add translations, you know, but what we really, you know, don't have, you know, until this guidance here, you know, something that tells you what to do once you get to Power BI desktop and you have, you know, data sets, you know, that have the metadata translations inside there. And I really can't think of, you know, good toolboxes. You know, at Microsoft, we, over the next year or two, you know, need to provide better tools. You know, mm -hmm. I think many people will look at this presentation I just gave, and you know, especially people that aren't developers and say, that was pretty bloody. You know, am I really gonna go down that path? You know, so, you know, what I tell people is, you know, if they ask, is it possible to reliably build multi-language reports in Power BI? The answer is absolutely yes. You know, is it difficult? Yes. Uh, you know, so that's the way I think about it. But, you know, I can't think of a gold toolbox other than the resources I presented here to get started. You know, hopefully over the next year or two, you'll see more things from Microsoft um, yeah. and tools yeah. like Translate Editor are doing more. And we do absolutely listen to our community in terms of, you know, what we want to develop. So if you do want to do this um, and you want us to make it easier, please, please, please go to ideas.powerbi.com, vote up existing multi-language ideas, and, um, you know, we listen and we'll we'll provide it eventually. Um, now, how, there's another question. Yeah, so there's three more here. So yeah. the first one is, you know, how do we translate localized Power BI paginated reports? And that's got a completely different way to do localization. Um, and I think we're still, we need to enable it in Power BI environments, um, you know, but um, so RDL files, you know, have their own uh, methodology for that. Uh, there's a question, what about right to left languages? You know, those are fully supported. Um, you know, so there should be no problem, you know, using, uh, you know, languages that are left to right or right to left. And the last thing, is it possible to use tabular editor to bulk add the translations from a CSV file? And the, and the answer is no, you really have to use tabular editors formatting or write advanced scripting to kind of do the, you know, the work to digest those files. Uh, and one, you know, one of the reasons that I created the, you know, translations builder developer sample is just to kind of give developers a starting point so they can just write code to, uh, you know, basically create translation files, you know, whether it's ResX files or, you know, any type of formatting, you know, that a translation team would want. It shouldn't be that difficult once you understand, you know, to use the tabular object model and to be able to kind of read what's in a data set. It should not be that hard to, you know, construct the files dynamically. Great question. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we are, we have come to the end of our session, unfortunately. Um, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. We know you can spend your time with anyone and it's fantastic that you spent it with Ted today. Um, Ted. Well, I thank you for hosting as always. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, for attending the session. And, you know, what I'd really love to see is, you know, some of you take what I have here and, you know, just move forward with it. And we'd love to see, you know, more language reports uh, in the wild there because, you know, yeah. once you understand the techniques, it's a very reliable process and it has a lot of value. And we can post those. Um, if you wanted to post examples, you can go to community.powerbi.com and go to the data stories gallery and please post your examples. And maybe in the next couple of months, we might have a competition on this and you might win some Power BI prizes. So how about how about we start doing that? Okay, sounds yeah, we, good to me. All right, well, have a great day, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks again, Ted. Thank you, Kelly.